Thank you. So I'll be talking about uh, how to share a secret infinitely. And this is joint work with uh, my students, Ilan Kumargotsky and Elon Yogev. So as you can see, this talk is about planning ahead. And sometimes the reaction for such gaffes is, uh, well, it's your fault. You should have done something. But we know that actually planning uh, scalable systems is difficult. And there are lots of horror stories uh, starting from, not starting, but Y2K may be the most prominent one. But there are lots and lots of uh, different examples where people design the system only to figure out after a few years that it's not really scalable. And uh, the, 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 the question we're faced with is, can we design scalable system without suffering a great deal of efficiency cost? And uh, what, we'll be talking, what we'll be doing in this talk is the subject when we talk about, when uh, in secret sharing. What can we do if we don't have a fixed upper bound in secret sharing? Now, one reason to look at these, all these questions is that even if there is an upper bound, even if there is actually an upper bound, uh, we do not want perhaps to waste uh, to do whatever it takes to work with this upper bound if there are fewer, if there are many, if there are many fewer uh, people that do show up to use the system. So uh, some examples of uh, Places where this issue, this issue comes up is, for instance, prefix codes of the integers. I'll come back to that example uh, shortly. Where you want to come up, we want to encode all the integers in a prefix-free uh, manner so that no uh, uh, encode, no code word is a prefix of another code word. And the question is, how can, uh, can you do it? I think perhaps the closest in nature to what I'm going to talk about are the bloom filters of a growing set. So you have a set, you don't know how large it's going to be, and you want to have some approximate representation of it. The question is how, ma how, uh, how many bits do you need? So in general, we know that if you are aiming for uh, an error of epsilon, you need something like n log 1 over epsilon bits. What happens if you, don't, if you don't have an upper bound in on the number of bits? And in this work, we'll be talking about secret sharing. So what is secret sharing? Well, uh, hopefully uh, you heard Amos's talk, so you know quite a lot, but I'll repeat the essentials. So in a secret sharing scheme, uh, you have a set of users, of participants, P1 up to Pn. You have a dealer who has a secret. The dealer you, uh, gives to users shares pi 1 up to pi n. And these shares are a probabilistic function of the secret S. And now a subset of users is either authorized or unauthorized. And, uh, and the natural assumption is that the unauthorized, uh, that once you're authorized, any superset of you is also authorized. And we want the authorized sets to be able to reconstruct uh, the secret S uh, given their shares. And we don't want the unauthorized ones not to learn anything, not to gain any knowledge about S. And uh, this thing, this whole idea of secret sharing was introduced by Blakely and Shamir in the late 70s. And the famous example was uh, threshold secret sharing. So, uh, the authorized sets are those that contain at least k out of n of the n parties. The unauthorized sets are those that, ha that have less than, uh, n, uh, than k participants. And uh, Adi, call, Adi Shamir called his paper How to Share a Secret, and we added the infinitely for the unbounded case. OK, so uh, what was the proposed solution? You fix a prime. A Q, which is at least n plus 1. You choose a random degree k minus 1 polynomial over g of q, such that uh, p of 0 is the secret s. And the shares are, uh, the, the share of participant i is the value of the polynomial at point uh, i. Reconstruction is done via polynomial interpolation. And uh, now that here we do assume we do need to know n in advance. 
right? We have to know in advance because we have to fix Q to be at least n plus 1. And the share size is log Q, where, uh, which is roughly log n. And in fact, this is, even if the secret is a single bit, I didn't say, I didn't talk at all about the size of the secret. Uh, uh, it's certainly, uh, the, the, the field should be at least the size of the secret. But uh, the, the lo there is a lower bound of due to Killian and Nissan and actually appearing in actual public writing only in the work of Cascudo, Kramer, and the King Ching that shows that you need log n bits uh, even if you have a single bit uh, a secret. So how is this relevant to us? So first, it means that you need, we need to know that this, uh, the fact that you need to know n it looks pretty inherent. I mean, certainly in such a scheme. What, but we are after, actually, are schemes that don't know, do not have an upper bound n in advance. But, well, what you know is how many people showed up so far. And you know something about uh, the reconstruction function so far. So, uh, in general, if you, in, instead of talking about a threshold, you can talk about uh, arbitrary access structures, uh, that, which is the indicator function of the authorized subsets. It, we're assuming, as I said, that it's monotone. It doesn't make much sense if it's not monotone, certainly in the information theoretic case. And what we want is that uh, for uh, any two subsets, we, if they are unauthorized, we want the distribution on the shares that they receive to be the same as, <coughs> uh, for any two secrets, so, sorry, for any uh, unauthorized subset, we want the distribution on the secrets that they receive to be the same. Uh, or equivalently, there is for any distinguisher, the probability that you distinguish between one secret and the other, that probability is zero. The complexity of the scheme is the size of the shares that are uh, distributed. And uh, maybe we should skip this example uh, and just a, a brief overview. So the first to talk about uh, general secret sharing, where Ito Saito and Shizeki, they say they pointed out that all access structures actually have a, a secret sharing, and uh, and uh, have a perfect secret sharing, and uh, it might be exponential. The construction they gave could could be exponential in the number of parties because they were based either on CNF or the DNF representation of the access structure. Uh, later, Benelow and Lecter uh, showed that you can use any of uh, the formula, any monotone formula, and this was generalized by Karchmer and Vigdusen to monotone span programs. So this is all recap of what uh, Amos was talking about. The major question here the ma is, can we prove lower bounds on the shares in some access structure? Even a non-constructive uh, result is interesting in this case. Okay, so back to our uh, evolving scheme. So the parties, we're assuming that the, uh, uh, that the parties arrive one by one. And the qualified sets are revealed when all the members are present. And uh, an upper bound on the number of parties is unknown. And the parties are only added and qualified, qualified sets remi remain qualified. You don't remove it. You don't become unqualified suddenly. And the shares are given only to the joining parties. You cannot refresh the shares of uh, the old parties. It's not that I gave Adam was is an old timer, I gave him a share, then Kobe shows up and I call Adam and say, ha, this is your new share. No. Uh, once Adam has a share, that's it. And uh, the natural question, can we even do this? And how large should the shares be? In this it's been looked into, especially, this is, a, the, I guess, in the literature, there, there are tons of works in general about uh, secret sharing, and but this is the closest, uh, the Chirmas and the Tardosh uh, work on online secret sharing, which is uh, roughly the same. And these two notions are different? The, the, uh, 
so well, okay, yeah, it's not, it's different. It's the same title of a paper, but different notions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, not, exa uh, not exactly, because, well, first, first there you know, um, uh, so there the issue is how to do it very quickly, for instance, right? You don't want the reconstruction well, to take a lot of time. Yeah. I, I, no, I, uh, yeah, but I don't think I don't think that uh, I think it's a little superficial. That's my my guess. But uh, you know, I probably need to think a little more about it. We don't have secrecy, but, but it's uh, like the same yeah, property, yeah. I, Pardon? Yeah. Okay. So what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you that any access structure can be done. You don't need to know the access structure before. And the share, what we talk about here, or not a total share size, which will perhaps have to grow with a, a n. But we can talk about what is the share size of the teeth party. The teeth party that is joined, how, what, what is the size of the share that it receives. So in general, we're going to see 2 to the t minus 1. For the k threshold, where you know that the uh, access structure is k threshold, then we can do uh, much better, not surprisingly. We can do k minus 1 times log t uh, plus k cubed times low order terms of t, of log t. And uh, for two threshold, uh, it looks something like log t plus log log t plus log 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 t, etc. And for some access structures like the ST connectivity, you don't need to increase it all. It's always one. And in fact, for this two threshold, this is tight. We need log t plus log log t, etc. And, the re and as we'll see, this will be, I guess, the second thing I'll show you, is that there is a tight relationship between two threshold and prefix-free codes. We can go from, uh, we, can, we can start with one and construct the other and vice versa. So uh, what I'll show you first are the general, uh, the construction for general access structures. Then I'll talk about the equivalence between two threshold schemes and uh, prefix codes. And then I'll give a, a different construction, not different, not totally different, but sort of a construction for two threshold, which will be a preparation for the k threshold. And uh, in both of these uh, uh, last two results, we'll be using a similar technique of domain reduction, going from a large domain to a much smaller domain. In the, uh, and uh, uh, achieving efficiency this way. And at least in the last one, we'll be used something that we call formula for the future, where you don't know the past, where you, do, you, know the pa you know something about the past, but you don't know about the future, but it, you somehow want to limit it. OK, so how do we do the general uh, axis structure? Well, let's uh, recall how we, do, uh, uh, how we do it in the standard setting, not in the involving one. So we will we we'll use the DNF of the, of the uh, access structure. And for each vector that represents a qualified set, the dealer gives party one, this party gives bit R1, party three gives R3, 
In the last part, it gives R1, X word with R3, X word with S. Okay, so for each, uh, for each qualified set, you give one bit to the participants in that uh, qualified set. Uh, now this would work uh, if there is an upper bound on the number of qualified sets a party is a member of. Then you could work with it because you're just giving random bits to. to the guy. And this is what Chirmas and uh, Tardish uh, suggested. But we don't have an upper bound on the, num on, on the number of sets. In particular, we, um, for instance, for k-threshold, there is no such uh, upper bound. So uh, what do we do? So uh, each party, party T holds 2 to the 2 minus 1 bits of this form, W of B1 up to BT minus 1, 1. So these guys could be arbitrary assignment. And we think of the last one as being 1. So it holds B such things. If party T completes a qualified set, so this is the, the minimal set that he completes, then what he does is uh, the bit he gets would be the XOR of, the, of all the prefixes, where we simply set that if the bit is, ends with a zero, we, we, we say that it's zero. So this is just for notation. So in other words, he gets what he really gets is the XOR of all the ones. For all the ones here, he gets the XOR of the corresponding bits there. And uh, otherwise, if it's not, it doesn't complete uh, a set, then this bit is just going to be random. Okay, so this is uh, this is it. And in terms of correctness, it's immediate because once you have uh, once you XOR them, you get back S. In terms of uh, sec security, again, it's, there isn't that much here. At least one of the uh, sort of components uh, with the secret must be missing if you don't have a qualified set. And we just had, we just randomized the whole thing. So, yeah. Uh, no, this is more like a uh, formula for the past. I don't know, for instance, the form I don't know any I don't know anything about the future. Yeah. I just give run if I, I, I just I, I, I'm not guessing I'm not making any guesses about the future, I'm just giving you a random bit. Okay. So, uh, and the total share size is two to the two minus one. Just to slow you down one more. In Hunt is what Alan's saying that you can. This corresponds to some rewriting of the uh, monotone formula as the. the uh, uh, yeah. Form. Yes. 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 Exactly. That's how you 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 get it. Uh, any other slowing down? <laughs> okay. So uh, you could, for instance, use it to get a threshold scheme. And because what we know about threshold is that the number of uh, qualified sets in which you can participate or uh, f finish is something like t choose k minus one. So uh, if you uh, so you you really need to store a bit only for the sets that are still unqualified and they can be at most this many so in this case you get a random bit and then you, there are all those ones that you do complete and then you get you get this XOR for them so maybe it's two times so this or maybe a sum here but certainly it's it's so it's going to be better for threshold it's going to be better than two to the uh, 2 to the t minus 1, it's going to be something like uh, t to the k. But still, it's not uh, what we want. We want to be much closer to, um, to, linear, to log t or something like that. Okay, so now I'm going to, sh to discuss the equivalence between prefix codes and uh, two th uh, threshold schemes. So, uh, 
so as we said, in a prefix, in a prefix code, node code word is a prefix of any other code word. And it's very good for unique decoding. And how do we construct it over the integers? Uh, so Elias suggested such a construction uh, where at first you think of it that you're encoding the length. You, you encode the length of the string in a prefix-free way. And then you just write, once you know the length, you just write the string. But then, of course, you have to write the, the length in a prefix-free way. So you write it again, length of the length, etc. And you get something like log t plus log log t plus log log log, etc. And uh, what we show is that the existence of a prefix-free code, where the code length is, uh, is little sigma of t, is equivalent to the existence of a two-threshold scheme for single-bit secrets, where the share of player t is of length sigma t. Okay, it's so one-to-one -one correspondence. So how do we go from a, a prefix-free code to a, to a, a threshold? So a, the dealer is going to choose a random string w that will be evolving. Um, so he chooses w, uh, uh, he, he grows it as he needs. And all he needs to do is remember the prefix of it so far. If the secret is zero, the share of party t is the prefix of length little sigma of t of uh, w. Okay, the pre prefix of length uh, sigma of t of w. Sig little sigma t is the length, capital sigma is the code word itself. Okay? So it gives, it gives him the length, it gives him uh, the, the, the prefix, the corresponding prefix of, the, uh, of this random string. If the secret is one, the share of party t is the string XOR with the code word, capital sigma t. Okay, you shift it by uh, this thing. So in both cases, you're getting a string of this length. And uh, reconstruction now, you're getting, you're getting two uh, words. If uh, one share is a prefix of the other, you uh, say that the secret is zero. Otherwise, uh, the secret is one. Okay. That's the reconstruction. So, uh, so right, so here, uh, so this is the string w, so to speak. This is sigma t. And you either give it, oops, you either, if the secret is zero, you give this path. Or if it's one, you take this path and XOR it with, uh, with capital sigma of t. So why, in terms of correctness, well, a shift by a string w of a prefix code yields a prefix code. I mean, if two things were prefix free, you XOR both of them with the same string, you'd still prefix free. In terms of secure, so therefore zero is encoded as zero, one is in, uh, zero is decoded as zero, uh, one is decoded as one. In terms of security, each string in itself is going to be a random, the, the share that party t gets is going to be a random string of length uh, sigma of t. And the share size, uh, as I mentioned, is log t is whatever. Well, take the best code, and then it will be log t plus log log t, etc. <coughs> uh, so, what about the lower bound? Well, this goes uh, back to uh, the property that uh, Amos mentioned in his talk of a pre of a secret sharing. We claim, or luckily we can rely on previous work, that for if, if, the, if the length of share t is empty, then we claim it must satisfy, for any n, it must satisfy 
this, that the sum of one over two to the mt it should be less than one. And the proof goes uh, from, uh, goes back, as, as we mentioned, goes back to Kilian Nissan, where you have two properties that because from uh, by secrecy, if you have to, if you take two random variables uh, where they, representing the distribution of the share where when the secret is zero and when the share, uh, the share is one, then you, we have the property that st is the probability that they're equal because they have the same distribution. Uh, the probability that, that they have the same value should be at least one over two to the mt. And uh, on the other hand, we know because every two parties determine the secret, we know that they cannot. You, you cannot have a collision in both. In, in, in two different locations, otherwise you, will, you would get, uh, other, otherwise we'll get, uh, the reconstruction be, will be wrong, so we get, uh, so we get uh, uh, this expression. And from this, so we, and this is really a Kraft's inequality. Kraft's inequality is a characterization of prefix code. So if, something, if, you, if you have a bunch of lengths that satisfy Kraft's inequality, you can construct a prefix code with uh, these properties. So we get back uh, what we wanted. In particular, it means that we know, uh, because, this con because the Elias construction is tight, we know that we need log t plus log log t, etc. So um, it means that the problem is a little bit harder than uh, what, you, what uh, you get without, with an upper bound, right? With an upper bound, you know that it's more like log t, but here we know that you, you here we see that you need a little extra. So, uh, can you go back to the construction? I'm, I realize I, I missed a step. So, so t is the The teeth guy, the teeth guy that shows up. Right, the identity. You encode it, there. you encode him. The same length. Sigma t. Yeah. And then don't they get like the same share either way? So they get the same share? So what? No, they wouldn't get the same share either way. In this case they would not get the same no, share. No, no, but the, like the two shares the same length. The same length. Oh, 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 sigma. Okay, sigma of t, sigma, uh, little, sigma t little sigma. Same. Little sigma is is little sigma is the length. Capital sigma right. oh, is okay. is the code itself. Okay. So this is, by the way, a nonlinear uh, scheme. Okay. So, uh, so it, in reality, of course, we did it the other way around. We, we first came up with a, with a scheme that we're going to see now, and then we started thinking how it looked too much like uh, the prefix free encoding, and then we figured out this uh, uh, tight relationship. So what is the scheme? What is the, it, and there is still a reason to, to study it, not only as a k-threshold, but when the secret is larger than one, you can get one bit, then you can gain more. So uh, we'll start, we'll have a basic scheme, which will be similar to Chirma's and Tardish's scheme, where party uh, t is given a random bit bt, and uh, for every for every for every i smaller than every j smaller than it, it's uh, sorry for every i smaller than t, it's going to get an, uh, uh, the bit b i prime, which is b i xored with s. This is the bit the, the random bit that i got. It's, it gets it xored with s, which is similar to what we described before. <coughs> So every pair i, j can compute s, because he knows this is from player i, this is from player j. So he has s. Uh, and no single player has uh, any information about s. And the share size is t bits. So t is, I mean, it's not a great scheme, but it's not uh, totally wasteful. So t bits. So now we want to do a domain reduction. So we start with this basic scheme. And what we do is we partition the parties into successive generations. So each uh, 
Poverty is assigned to generations, and the, ge the generations are geometrically increasing in size. And within a generation, we use a standard two-threshold scheme. And, uh, and this would, of course, handle the case where both parties come from the same generation. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and then for between generations, we generate for all the generation one share per scheme of, of that thing. Of the, of the basic scheme. So any two parties from different generation hold two shares of the evolving, of the basic evolving scheme and therefore they can reconstruct. So uh, we need to store both, so this is a little wasteful of them, but then we, we figure out that we can continue this on and on and reduce the, the size <laughs> as much as we want. Uh, let's, uh, I think that's fairly clear, so let's keep it. And, uh, yeah, so as we mentioned, we can uh, go on and on, and we get a, a share which looks like this, if we stop it uh, after two steps. Okay, so now we want to do the k-threshold scheme. Uh, so we want to do the k-threshold scheme. So first, we'll also do, we'll start with a basic scheme. Which one? That, that's actually going to be more involved. And uh, we're going to partition the, uh, the parties into generations. And the generations, again, are going to be geometrically increasing in size. The base is going to be k rather than 2. Or, I mean, it's going to be k to the g. That's going to be the size of generation g. And uh, Within a generation, we're going to use uh, the Shamir K threshold uh, scheme. And this is going to handle the cases where all the, of them come from the same generation. This is as before. And uh, now, what we're going to do, we're going to generate K minus one shares of the basic sch scheme and split it between the parties of the generation so that any I parties can learn I of these secrets. So in the most naive way, you can do it using Shamir secret sharing scheme. K, K is the threshold. So within, within the generation, you generate for that generation K minus one shares of the basic scheme or of the previous scheme. You take these, you, you're not going to give them directly to anyone. You, you share them so that any k parties can reconstruct i of them. Any i parties can reconstruct i of these shares. Any, any k. No, no. Any i parties can reconstruct i of the shares of, that we've uh, generated for the basic scheme, for this generation. Uh, no, we, do, we, we don't care which I. But, but I, most I, I, most I. At most I, yeah. Okay. And at least I. <laughs> <laughs> then it really has No, it can be any, there are K minus, for this, this generation has K minus one shares. If you think of the two scheme, it, there was one share, it was trivial. You just gave it to everyone. Now, now we have k minus one shares. We're not giving any one of them in particular to a player. We're sharing them. So we're giving, uh, you, you can think of it this way. The first, we, uh, the, you can think of it that there is one share that we give to anyone. Then we do a secret sharing for the second share with a, a two out of one secret sharing. Right, right. For the third one, we do a three out of, uh, et cetera. And this is all standard secret sharing, and you can do slightly better than uh, my description. But this description is good enough. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, right. So we get these shares from the basic scheme, and and we we share them. Okay. So now, uh, what is the share size of a party? It's going to be we have k minus one secrets times log t with k minus 1 times log t, plus k times uh, 
sigma, the previous scheme. This is like our previous scheme. This is not the previous scheme, but now because the generations uh, are exponentially, uh, but, but, uh, the, your, your uh, generation is roughly log t, the, what you need, you need to do is call the previous scheme with log t plus k, with parameter log t plus k. So we get, uh, so the question is where do we start? Where is uh, sigma zero? Okay, because that's going to be very important. And if we're not careful, we get something that is exponential in k. Okay, we want to be polynomial in k. If you do something naive, for instance, the, the naive secret sharing, you'll get something like log, t, like the one, let's say, take the general scheme that I discussed and plug it in here you'll get something of the form log t to the k. Okay. And Sorry, why not k times? I'm decreasing also k a little bit, but that wouldn't well, help a lot. Oh, okay, but the basic, thing, the basic sure. issue is what do we do with the, okay, we're saying we, here at this step, right, we're generating, we're generating k minus one shares of the basic scheme. Let's do one step. We're generating k minus one shares of the basic scheme. And what what and it's very important what this basic scheme is. Okay. Uh, okay, so <coughs> so as we said, at any point we know the past, but we don't know the future. We don't really know the past, but we have a good idea what's going on. But we have no idea where the shares from the future will come in. Who, who are they going to be? But the point is we don't really care. We only care about their number. We only care how many such shares there are. How many shares uh, uh, come from the future. So, uh, and there are only k such options. So, uh, we're going to, well, we can do it for any uh, value of uh, between uh, zero and k minus one. And uh, so now what we do is, this is the base, in the basic scheme itself, we group parties into generations that are geometrically increasing. Uh, let's start with two generations. So the case of three generations is a little bit different than the case of uh, three generations will already, will have things for, for the first generation and things from the third generation. But let's start with the case where we have only two generations. Uh, so S is going to generate, S itself is going to generate X1 up to, uh, to XK and Y1 up to YK, where X, X, uh, X1 up to, uh, up to X, XK represent in unary, how many people showed up from generation one? And y1 up to yk represent in unary how many people showed up from generation two. So we have a very simple formula here. It's a very simple formula that we should reconstruct S if it's, uh, if xi and y, if xi is one and yk uh, minus i is one. We should be able to reconstruct the secret if and only if this formula is one. Uh, so this, uh, remember, with formulas we have good uh, sh secret sharing. So we, we share, we generate shares. Oops. Uh, yeah. We, xi is shared such that any i parties can generate, uh, from generation one can recover it. Yi is shared such that any i parties from generation two can recover it. Again, using Shamir uh, secret sharing scheme. Pardon? When you say this, what are you referring to? No, uh, what? Well, I call it Yi, and Yi is, sh if you want to call it a Yk minus i, you can call oh, it Yk. Okay. <laughs> Just whatever you want to call it as long as it's consistent. So, uh, and this, these are, this is fine. This is, a, for two generations, this is fine. Once we have more generations, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, uh, so, 
the point is that we are going to share each y, each y i here, we're going to share it for generation three. Okay, so uh, uh, again, but this time with the threshold k minus i. So, uh, and so in general, each generation you, you tells the next generation not only the, not, not only should you be able to not only should you be able to reconstruct the secret, but you should also be able to you, you should. Sh uh, your burden is to share the yi's of my generation using your uh, uh, using uh, uh, your info. So the shares grow from generation to generation, but that's okay because the generation grow even uh, more. So we're in pretty good shape, or and the end result is that we get something like uh, because the generation grow, the generation j is of size k to the j we get something like a, a kt times log kt. That's going to be the size of the basic scheme. But again, remember, we're never going to use it with a large t. We're going to shrink using the domain thing. So that's not too bad. So what's important is that it, it's not worse than that. OK. So. Um, There are still lots of stuff that can be done. Uh, the most interesting one is lower bound for the general access structure. So this is an easier problem than uh, the standard model because you can use the fact that you don't know, uh, you have no knowledge about the, ac about the access structure uh, when you're giving the shares. So think of it. Think of a, a sh think of a scheme where the last guy, it's going to be all of size n, but th the last guy has to be present. So really, you're gaining absolutely uh, no information about the access structure until the last guy shows up. All you can do is give them correlate some correlated randomness. And now the question is, can you use this to come up with a lower bound on the size of the shear? Yeah, I will have a bounded number of parties. So I'm using just the fact that I don't know the the scheme when I give the first parties their their uh, shares. So can you can you prove a lower bound based on that? Then uh, for the k threshold, I mean, the natural question is: I mean, okay, we got something like k log t. Can we do something closer to log k plus log t, which is what we get from Shamir's uh, secret channel? Here is a very concrete uh, scheme that we are not sure how to do, uh, which seem to make sense, which is dynamic majority. So you have uh, what you want the legitimate set, the authorized sets, to be those that where there is a prefix so that the majority, the majority of it has arrived. Something like that. So. Can you can you do uh, can you do this in, re in in any reasonable manner? Now, the whole point not the whole point, but a, a major application of secret sharing is to multi-party computation, and the question is whether this way of thinking is relevant at all. Can you talk about multi-party computation that behave uh, in a similar uh, manner? Now, the good news is most of our schemes are linear, which is good in the, for constructions of MPC. But here we're not quite sure what the correct definitions or what exactly it means. So we have the good property, but we don't know what, the <laughs> what is MPC in this setting. And uh, I talked about perfect. Can we get anything from statistical? The lower bound still holds. There isn't, you wouldn't get a whole lot. By, by the lower bound on two threshold. But uh, in general, is allowing statistical error. What about computational security? It's, again, it's very difficult to define in this setting. It's not impossible, but certainly it's not uh, completely straightforward. Now finally, as I mentioned, there are tons of variants in secret sharing, like uh, verifiable secret sharing, robust. Robust seems perhaps the most natural one to ask. 
can we get robust? And I think that the techniques I, I, I showed here can be adapted to get something about robust secret sharing. So within a generation, you'll do a traditional robust secret sharing. Robust secret sharing means that you can check when someone gives, uh, when you do the reconstruction, you can check that uh, the uh, share is valid. And within a generation, you can use uh, traditional robust secret sharing. In between generations, you can also do something uh, perhaps more expensive, but you can do something. Uh, visual secret sharing, can you do visual secret sharing when you don't know how many parties you have? Uh, so you can ask all the traditional secret sharing schemes in uh, this setting. Okay, thank you.